Hi, everyone. Welcome to Silent Voices for the Children. I'm Don McCarty. And I'm Caroline Rena. And today we have such an amazing, awesome guest. Um, love the guy makes women cry. So we are welcoming this evening Mr. Bill McGee, uh, the author of Half the Child, this great book that I'm about halfway through. Oh, I'm actually ha more than halfway through. And um, yeah, so Bill, if you want to give us a uh, brief background, we are definitely ready to jump in and, and go. Great. Well, first of all, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with both of you. Gotten to know you both a little bit in recent months. And uh, this was something I've really been looking forward to. So yes, half the child. Um, if you hold up a copy, I'll hold up a copy too. Ooh, this ooh, is, this oh, is a novel. It's fiction. <laughs> and it's, it's told um, in first person uh, by a young man named Michael Mullen, who is, he basically has two passions in life. One is uh, his job, which is uh, a very nondescript, unimportant job. He's an air traffic controller at New York's LaGuardia Airport. So he's got a stressful job. And uh, his other real passion is his young son, Benjamin. And the, the novel takes place over four consecutive summers when Ben is two, three, four, uh, four and five. And each summer has a different stage in Ben's development. And um, their lives sort of go from bad to worse, to worse, to worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, what starts out as a separation with Michael and Ben's mother uh, leads to a divorce and then a custody battle and then parental alienation, and then it, uh, it culminates in an abduction. And uh, to the point where, without giving too much away, Michael doesn't even know where his son is for a very long summer. Yeah. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's out there, it's available in print and Kindle, and soon to be an audio book, I'm very excited to, to, to report. And uh, I'm so excited to talk about Half the Child and Parental Alienation and my learning curve on all of this because I've been learning as much as, uh, as, much as anyone in the last couple of years. Well, real quick, she introduced you as the guy that makes women cry. Can you explain to our audience <laughs> what you were told as you were trying to, to write this book? Sure, sure. And I guess, you know, for context, um, this is not my first book. I also um, have this book, Attention All Passengers, which is an expose on the airline industry. Um, if, you're a f if you're a fearful flyer, there might be a few sections in there you might want to skip, um, but it's important work. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, lot of, a culmination of a lot of my investigative reporting work at Consumer Reports and elsewhere over many years. And so for that book, it was traditionally published, as they say. I had an agent and it was sold to HarperCollins, uh, one of the biggest publishers. And, you know, I did a whole media tour and CNN and Fox and all that a couple years ago. And so when it was time for Half the Child, uh, I got a new agent and a, a young man at one of the largest agencies in the country, in the world. And he said, you know, he was very excited. And he said, we're going to send this out. And um, we just got rejection after rejection after rejection for Half the Child. And so here's the thing. I mean, all writers get rejected. It's just it's part of the game. It's like, you know like being a baseball pitcher, not taking a loss once in a while, you know, it's just inevitable. But there was something unusual about the rejections for this. So I, I eventually invented a new word and that word is called a, a regerb. Um, the, uh, the term for what's on the back of a book when you see an endorsement from someone, like on the back of Attention All Passengers, it's Ralph Nader, he, he liked the book, and Captain Sully Sullenberger, who you probably all know, you may know him as Tom Hanks in the movie. Um, Right. So those, right. are called, those are called blurbs. Um, for Half the Child, I have some wonderful blurbs on the back from wonderful authors, Catherine Taylor, Judith Stone, Tom DeHaven. But um, I invented this term called regerb, which is a combination of a rejection and a blurb. Because the rejections that we got for Half the Child um, were so good that they could have been used on the, on the back, even though they were saying they didn't want to publish it. One was three pages long, which is sort of Wow. unprecedented i mean you know usually rejection trust me i've gotten i've got enough to wallpaper my walls so usually, no wasn't enough <laughs> yeah it's like usually it's like you know wow you so much, you know. in as your forward <laughs> <laughs> so i you know so I, I reached out to some writer friends and i said um is it me i mean you know rejection is one thing but usually rejection is you know thank you so much for letting us look at this we wish you luck you know i hope this finds a home 
you know, well, this, you know, they were going on and on about uh, the book and it made them laugh and it made them cry and, but they were turning it down. So I reached out to writer friends and I said, you know, is it me? Cause I don't have any perspective here. And, and they said, no, something really unusual is happening here. And it really has to do not with the quality of the book. I think it's safe to say, but with the, the industry, the publishing industry and how, you know, the decisions are made to publish things. And, and the consensus from so many of the editors who got back to us were that um, this sort of um, these old wives tales that women are the only people that buy books and women are the only people that read books and men don't buy books and men don't go to bookstores and men don't read. Um, and therefore, since this book is told from a father's perspective rather than a mother's perspective, I mean, if the genders had been reversed, I'm sure it would have been sold in about an hour but it's not told from a mother's perspective, it's told from a father's perspective, so therefore women aren't gonna to wanna to read that. So I argued uh, to no avail and I said, well, no, I think, you know, first of all, women that see this um, will wanna give it to the men in their lives who maybe could relate to it, but they also would relate to them themselves, you know. So that's, I think, the allusion to, um, to making women cry which I try well, to do part of it. That's part yeah. of it. I want to throw the other context in it because I've been reading, I got to a point in that book and I just started bawling. Like, I mean, we kind of talked, alluded to that earlier. Mm -hmm. um, but I just started bawling because it like hit a nerve because my children, I, I, because as the mother that was alienated, I was just reading, you know, just one little sentence that Ben said, and I lost it. I mean, I literally went through a, I guess, a, a PTSD reaction. So this woman cried, and this woman was very interested, and this woman is going back to it. Um, but she I just bought wanted... the book. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, and, and um, I was also going to say, I just wanted to answer something that you said. It's like the publishing world mentality is still set in the dark ages, it seems, by, yes. by what you just yes. said. Yes. And yes. that might be a why. is that why a lot of people are going into self-publishing? I'm just curious. I think so. I mean, yeah. you know, look, my, my father's generation and my generation and, and men younger than me who are fathers, there's just no comparison, you know, and yeah, it's not yeah. to bash fathers from another generation, but the stereotypes that are perpetrated in Hollywood, in book publishing, in on Madison Avenue with advertising, um, that's sort of a, a leitmotif that runs through the book. There's a scene, not a long scene, where Michael is in the grocery store and he's, he's bombarded. He's buying groceries for his young son and himself, cereal and cheese and everything else. And he's bombarded with, you know, kick cereal, mother approved. And, you know, um, moms love Robitussin and moms approve of this. And, and he's like, well, I, I buy cheese too. And I buy cough syrup, you know. Um, you know, you still see that. It's 2020. It's, it's, it's absurd. Um, so many fathers, as we all know, as both of you know, as I know, are so devoted, so caring, so loving. They are not fathers who don't know their kids' teachers' names or their best friends' names or their teddy bears' names. You know, I, I know that that was a stereotype, rightly or wrongly, that existed for many years. It's just false now, and it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, in, in, the, in the acknowledgments in the book, I call out many friends who have helped me over the years, and I, I called out, you know, the great dads that I know. You know, and, 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 you know, whether it's my brother or whether it's, you know, friends of mine or coworkers, you know, and there, there, there are these scenes all through the book of Michael running smack up against old prejudices, you know, whether it's advertising or there's one scene, I mean, I hate to call out a TV show publicly, but I'm going to do it. What the hell? Um, you know, there's one scene where uh, Michael's a boxer, like I am, and he's in the gym and he's working out and the TV is on up and he sees and he looks up and you talk about a visceral reaction. It's um, everybody loves Raymond, you know, and he just goes into a rage and starts pounding the bag because... Um, you know, here's uh, this this very popular show with very talented people and funny and everything else, but it's like seriously, this is you know this is this is just a few years ago, and this father knows nothing about his kids. You know, the 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 wife is a super wife like they always are on TV, and a super mom. And I'm not knocking moms and wives, but it's just the father's an idiot, basically, right? He's a funny idiot, but he's an idiot, right? So is his father. Right, exactly. But it's like, you know, he learned nothing, right? Right. And so, you know, I, when I see shows like that, when I see commercials like that, you know, uh, I turn on the TV and I'll see a commercial where the father is hiding, you know, at the garage because it's chore day. And there's mom and the kids saying, you know, there he is again, you know. Yeah, yeah. 
it just drives me crazy. You know, you know what? And I, I agree with you. I think um, our society, and that's the thing with TV is like, our psychology is so open and, and mal malleable, I guess that's the right word to um, the psychology of what the commercials put out there, what the shows put out there. And you seem to think, and that's going to lead us into some other questions later anyway, for what you're going to talk about, but it leads us to think a certain way about Absolutely. the way things are. And it's not every single person on the face of this planet has had a different experience in their life. And you can't right. just because yeah. you've experienced a certain thing doesn't mean that everybody has experienced it. So that doesn't mean that you're right about whatever. Well, you and on top of that, you've got moms that may know your teacher's names, but that's because moms are usually the ones that coordinate all of that kind of things but dads know different things dad knows who the football coach is dads might know who your soccer coach is they they know different types of information and neither one of them are right or wrong it, right. it's just a difference between who is in charge of what in that particular family and right. even extending from that there are families that have dads that do all that stuff so they they they, they do know all that you know yeah, so you it's know, like dads that braid hair for their daughters in the morning right? they, they go to school they paint toenails mm -hmm. or let them you know, paint there yeah. <laughs> absolutely and and you know of all the things i do and i've had you know i, I do multiple things I, i'm a teacher and i'm a journalist i'm a novelist i'm, I'm an advocate but no, no title I've ever had in my life is, is more precious to me than being a dad, you know. You know uh, what, Bill, this is, this is a good spot to start to ask you this question because I really, really want to get an idea, even if it's short, whatever you want to say, you know, can you give us a little bit of a story of how this all started or, or pushed you in the direction of becoming an advocate? Because I've heard you also say that we, a lot of us don't plan on becoming advocates because we, right. you know, right. so I'd like, I'd like to get a little bit of a background about, you know, what, what pushed you there sure absolutely um you know I'm, I'm a writer i always have been and i write both fiction and nonfiction. so i'm a journalist and i'm a novelist and uh, as a journalist i write um uh, almost exclusively these days about aviation and airlines and aviation safety and um so like all journalists when i started out i was you know it was drummed into me to be impartial and to you know listen to both sides and, and all of that and then I wound up at Consumer Reports magazine 20 years ago. And I became the editor of Consumer Reports Travel Letter. It's a sister publication for Consumer Reports. And so I was writing about airline safety and things like that. And it's funny how kids always come back into my life. People have pointed out to me that even in my work where it looks like there's no connection, the connection always seems to be kids and young people, whether it's teaching or this novel. Or I started doing a lot of advocacy work, for example, on children not being restrained on airplanes. Um, the, the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, and airlines in the U.S. allow children under two to travel as lap kids, and mm -hmm. many people do it. I did it when my son was younger. I didn't know better, um, and then the more I researched it, I realized just how dangerous it is, and, um, you know, like everything else, it's about profits, so the FAA listens to the airlines and hasn't done anything about this, so I became an advocate, and suddenly some of my old journalism friends said, wait, you're testifying in Congress and you're, you're, you're going on CNN and talking about airline safety? You're not a journalist anymore. And, um, but I found a home at Consumer Reports where I'm still, I'm still working for them as a consultant uh, because I realized, you know, there's certain things that don't have two sides. <laughs> um, I don't have any problem being called biased if I'm biased on the favor, on, and, you know, in, the, in regard of not having airplanes craft, then yes, call me biased. Yeah. I, I don't believe there are two sides to certain things. So that's how my advocacy started with airlines. And um, when I, I spent many, many years working on Half the Child. And um, uh, I don't talk too much about my, my own story. I know a lot of people asked about it. Uh, I'll share with you that I, I'm a single dad. I, I have been since my son was two. And uh, he's an adult now and he's fantastic. And he'll be annoyed because I'm gonna say that he's the love of my life and he's a great guy and he's gonna say- They all get annoyed about stuff like that. Yeah, I, okay. I, I tell them there are worse things in life than having your father praise you too much in public. Right, you know, like, right. Deal with it. Dad. Yeah, right. let, them, let, them, let them tell you all they want, that they're the love of your life, that they love you. Let them do it because there are others that never hear that, so. Right. right. Yeah, good point, Don. Thank you, thank you. Right, right. and I, I don't mean to, you know, sound um in any way like i'm feeling sorry for myself or anything like that but you know, know i grew up with a very different type of father than i am and um and i i recognize he had challenges i never had and he you know he 
he suffered his whole life from PTSD from World War II. He was in some of the worst mm -hmm. combat in World War II. And, you know, he, he was not someone who would yeah. say, to, he had 11 children. I'm the youngest of 11. And he didn't say, you know. Yeah. Out of you, generation. Uh, you know, yeah, that generation. You, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I do you know. I'm sorry. I do have a question for you about the going back to the car seats and the children being restrained yeah. or not. And I'm not sure who posted it. Maybe you posted it. There was a video about a parent getting kicked off of a plane recently. This is like, like only in the last couple months where they had actually purchased an extra seat so that they could actually put their son in the car seat that's strapped and that mm -hmm. he could sleep because he sleeps better in the car seat. Well, they didn't want to let him have the seat that he actually paid for and they were kicking him off of the plane because they wanted to let another passenger sit in the seat even though he just paid for it. So he paid for all three of these seats and the airline made him get off the plane right. because they couldn't use the seat that he purchased. So they double sold the seat right. and they would not let the child sit in a car seat. They said, no, the child must be on your lap. I know the story you're talking about and I, I, I follow these issues very, very closely. So I have sort of algorithms built into news feeds and I, I see all the stories that have to do with child seats. And it was horrific, but it is, unfortunately, it was not uncommon. Um, you would be amazed how many airlines don't train their frontline employees, uh, flight attendants, et cetera, what the, you know, what the policies are. And so people like me are out there saying, please, if, you know, buy, a, buy, a, buy an airline seat so you can put the child seat in it and your, your, your child will be safer. And then people listen to people like me and they go out and they do that and then they get to the airport and they find out that the airline said, no, I'm sorry, that seat's not available, or no, you can't bring the car seat on board, and, and they're wrong, you know. And so it's very, very frustrating. And um, like so many other things having to do with journalism and investigative journalism, yeah. it's the oldest thing in the world, follow the money. Um, you know, we have a Federal Aviation Administration that, you know, receives uh, its marching orders from the airlines. And I say that well, what's, what's What's maddening to me is the fact that one, he purchased the seat. So for that flight, he owns the seat. Absolutely. But for the airline, they're like, no, we get to control the seat. And even though you paid us for the seat, we sold it. So we got double, we got to double dip and right. we don't care what right. you were, what your intentions were. We decided that this was the way it's going to be. Well, so anytime right. you buy the airline something. airline could not have been wrong and they compounded their error and they made it even worse. But um, in, in March, I know the date, it was March 3rd, I testified in Congress um, something I do fairly frequently about seven or eight times now and I testified on the issue of families not being seated together uh, before the the House Transportation Committee and um, this is something that Consumer Reports we were very active in advocating about for several months it sort of died down when coronavirus hit because planes were so empty but now it's starting to ramp up again and this problem is coming back um, airlines are charging families with children, believe it or not, as young as three, two, even one years old, to sit together. Um, and we just think that's egregious and unacceptable. Um, and yeah. for all the ways airlines nickel and dime us with baggage and, you know, um, uh, change fees and all the rest of it, well, um, to charge families with young children. So we had hundreds and hundreds of complaints yeah. from families. Well, if I, got, if I got charged something for, in, the whole thing is, is if I buy something, I get something in return, right? Mm -hmm. There's that exchange value. So why are airlines allowed to not do that? Because they're, not, the, they're allowed because, to just get away with that. Yeah, because the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration is part of the Department of Transportation. Um, they don't represent us, you and me, and all the other taxpayers like they should. They represent the interests of the airlines. And um, that's why you saw the debacle last year with the Boeing, Boeing 737 MAX in which, um, you know, the FAA, instead of doing its job and making sure that that plane was built properly, allowed Boeing to self-police and they allow the airlines to, to self-police all the time. So right. it's, uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, uh, I, you know, I don't mind telling you that, um, you know, I, I fight these fights along with other advocates and, um, our one loss record is not good because well, thankfully um, we have a lot of money. <laughs> thankfully we have someone like you in there trying to, to set it right.
it's hard. Um, I, I actually became friends uh, with Ralph Nader about two years ago, and he's been doing this for so long. No matter what you think about him, he's a, sort of a, a guy that you know generates strong opinions. Um, he is so devoted to consumers; it's his whole life, you know. And I said to him, you know, he's so much older than me. I mean, he was doing this when I was, you know, a toddler. And I said to him, you know, I, I really meant it from the heart. I said, how do you? keep it up like don't you get frustrated after a while and just want to you know just throw in the towel you know because we're fighting such deep pockets in, in corporate America you know and he just looked at me and he said well you have to fight for a better world you know and it was like it was so simple but it gave me chills you know because I said you're right how can I complain that I'm you know I'm losing battles yeah, it's just like, give up. you have to fight the good fight you know yeah exactly and that's a good segue to you know fighting for kids when it comes to parental alienation and these issues, you know. Um, I, I came to this through a side door, you know. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm doing my work at Consumer Reports and I'm advocating on airline issues. And I, I, you know, at night and weekends, I'm writing a novel. And, you know, I thought, okay, well, you know, this novel's gonna be released and I'll go out there and I'll do readings and I'll do the things that novelists do in you know, bookstores and book clubs. And suddenly I find myself in this world of parental alienation and um, I have no problem sharing this with you. Um, I'll, I'll share it with both of you. I shared it when I spoke uh, last fall in Philadelphia at the Parental Alienation Support Group uh, Conference. Um, I stood up and I said, I spent years and years, um, almost 20 years, now not 20 years straight, sitting there for 20 years every day, but on and off. I worked on Half the Child for many, many years. I put it aside. I worked on other projects. I wrote other books. I did all kinds of things. But on and off, it was a very, very long-term project because I had trouble getting it clear in my head. And then once it did, it all fell into place. Um, and so I stood up in front of this group of parental alienation experts, several hundred people. They were lawyers and psychologists and counselors and, and, and you know, both um, uh, parents who had been victims of parental alienation and grown children who had been victims of parental alienation. So both of you can relate as well. And I said there and I said, so I wrote a novel about parental alienation. And I have to tell you that um, up until about two years ago, I didn't know what the term meant. I'd never heard it that I could remember. Okay. Um, and I think that's very important for me to share that for others to share that because I think that's a big part of what Half the Child is about is the fact that sometimes something has a name and you're not even aware of it. And I think so many of us, no matter what the experience is, whether it's a veteran returning from, you know, uh, from combat, whether it's someone who's had um, some kind of trauma, um, certainly anything having to do with, you know, custody and abduction, we think we're all alone, you know. And there's a scene with Michael Mullen in the book where he, um, <laughs> Uh, wrongfully, he is accused of needing um, uh, anger management, which he, he doesn't. He's not a violent person, but um, a it's one. a tactic that's <laughs> often used in custody battles. And mm -hmm. so he's accused of being violent, even though he, he hasn't hit anyone. He's not, he, he boxes, but that's a sport. And um, so he's sent to anger management where he is most definitely a fish out of water. He's in a room full of really, really violent men. Oh, wow. um, and he's like, I'm just a guy in a you know, golf shirt, I don't, you know, I don't belong here. And, um, you know, when he, when he leaves there, he says, uh, it's sort of become a mantra for me and for this book, he says, I, to the, to the, since it's written in first person, he's speaking to the reader, he says to the reader, I feel like I'm a demographic of one, you know, and I think that's, that's really the, the one of the main themes that runs through After Child, is when you go through these experiences, you don't realize that others have too. And so when I was writing this, I mean, again, I mean, on one hand, somebody could say, oh, this guy's a knucklehead. He wrote a book and he didn't even know there was a term for what he was writing about. Um, the fact is, when I first, about six months before the book was published, I started doing some research on who might be interested in it and who could we send copies to and things like that. And it's parental alienation. What Google, you know? And of course, I was up until four in the morning that night, just, you know, Googling and Googling and Googling. And I said, oh, it has a name, right? That's interesting. I want to. I'd like to. I'd like to share something because when I first found out about this, it was twenty years ago, mm -hmm. and of course, there's nothing online about parental alienation. And I found out about it from my kids, my my ex and his wife, um, 
procured, I'm going to use that word because this person is, is, is a, a thorn in my side, unfortunately, um, a therapist who was a forensic therapist who told who, who saw what was happening in the room when we had an appointment with her, pulled me aside after three years of going through it and told me parental alienation. And then years later, when I went back to her to try and get um, her to help out, to help the kids out, she was like, I never told you that, that type of thing. So, but, but what, I'm, what I wanted to get to is just knowing the word actually helped me, and it sounds like that's what happened um, similarly with you, is that it made me stop feeling so alone, that there was, if, if somebody had a word for it, that somebody else had to have gone through it. And it was really important for me to know that. And when I knew the word, I did the same thing. I went, I went online, but of course nothing, I, I didn't find anything for like years after that, after I finally right. found out about it, you know? So, right. um, yeah, so it's good that. For me, it wasn't until after my dad died, then, then it's, as I was trying to figure out what the heck happened, that's when I started learning more about the word. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, you know, if you have the Kindle version of Half the Child and you do a, a word search and you put in the term parental alienation, it's only going to appear once in here. And it's not uttered by Michael because he doesn't, you know, it's actually uttered by a, by a, by a therapist to Michael. And, um, you know, uh, I, I understand that I could have written a different novel and I could have, you know, used that term and done a lot. I didn't want to. I, you know, I, I taught creative writing for 10 years and I taught both fiction and creative nonfiction. And I used to say to my students all the time, you know, they would read the opening paragraph of something. And I'd say, okay, let's stop. How many decisions did you make in that opening paragraph with, you know, 120 words? And we could come up with hundreds, you know? And so, you know, authors make decisions for a reason. I made a decision that this book would be written in first person, I, rather than third person, he or she. And um, most novels, uh, statistically, are usually third person. I wanted it to be I because I wanted it to be from Michael's point of view and only his point of view. I didn't want to have the point of view of the lawyers and the judges and the doc. I wanted to just like have binders on because he has binders on because he he's an air traffic controller. What does he know from this? He's not a lawyer. He's not a psychologist. He talks to airplanes all day. So he's very good at his job, but you know he never saw this coming. He didn't know that his wife was unhappy. He didn't know that he was about to have. A, he didn't want a divorce. He was blindsided by it and as upsetting as that was it was a hundred times more upsetting to lose his son and he never dreamt that he would lose his son and he fights it tooth and nail you know so but that's um, so powerful i wanted to interrupt because I, I i just you, you keep giving, giving these really good blurps about stuff and i just want to get, expand oh, on them oh, um, uh, so when you by writing it in the first person though for me having you know starting to read it it, it literally puts the reader in the place of, and especially for someone who's been through it, it's like that's healing in itself reading it because it's, oh my God, this person understands me, you know? And it's just, even though Michael is talking about it and Michael is a father, he right. still understands what I've been going through. It's like, oh my God, the words that you're using in there, you know, I thought that and I thought that and that's what I thought and you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and it was just, that's what's so powerful about putting it in first person. Um, well, because it's, it's I appreciate it. Yeah, that was the goal, you know, and the yeah. other decision that I made, which is, again, fairly, I won't say it's uncommon, but most novels are written in past tense, statistically, mm -hmm. and this one is written in present tense, right? Yes. And again, you know, trust me, I mean, if Uh-oh. Uh-oh, freeze? Mm. <laughs> Give me a second. Oh God, it's a good thing that these things are getting recorded. <laughs> yeah. Bill? I'm here. Oh, Bill, okay. You, you two froze. froze, but I didn't. Was it me? No, well, I don't know who froze. I mean, you froze for us, so okay. I don't know. <laughs> okay, sorry. That's okay. So I'm not Zoom froze. <laughs> okay. Zoom froze, yeah. I actually, I'm using this little MiFi thing because it's better internet than I have in the house with the router. So whenever I do anything, you know, that's live, I use this. Oh, wow. I, yeah, it's the thing I got from Verizon. And, you know, it's expensive because they charge you by the minute, but it's, it's worth it for something like this because, yeah. you know. Well, we could still talk, but you, you, your, your picture was frozen. Yeah, and you guys were frozen for me. Okay, so... 
Um, well, I can take that from the top, basically. I was just saying about um, present tense, you know, that, um, so the decision to write this in present tense was deliberate as well, because I wanted Michael, I look at this, I've, I've referred to this before when I've talked about the book, I look at it as sort of one long car accident. It's one long drama that every time Michael thinks, okay, things are getting a little better, they not only don't get better, they get much worse. Um, yeah. This is just a progressive thing where it just, things just keep getting, he thinks like, well, things are going to start turning soon and they turn for the worse. Yeah. And, and okay. So here's another one you just That's made great. me think of. It's like present tense, especially in something like this makes it feel like it's going in slow motion. Just like Absolutely. it feels when you're going through Absolutely. alienation, it feels everything is like, Absolutely. you know, and well, nothing's you happening. Your, you can't get your breath. You can't get, right. your, you can't right. get grounded, you know, and, and, and you keep thinking like, okay, we're going to court next Monday, but after that, things will be settled down, you know, and it's worse than ever. And it's right, worse than ever. And it's right. Worse than ever. And, that, and that puts you right in that in the character. Right. And it's like, oh, yeah. And I think that's why when, when I went through my thing with it, I had such a hard time because it, I was in him. I was literally inside of his head reading it. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to cuss, but I did. Um, <laughs> And, and so it actually brings up something that I want to ask you, though, because I have been working on my own um, book for years, and I like what you said about the creative nonfiction, because that was something I wanted to do. And I know Dawn has, is, is working on a book as well, and we've even bounced back and forth doing on one together, you know, that type of thing. My question, though, is, and this has always been something that's followed me, is like, was there a catharsis for you in writing the book? Um, for your healing or was that just um, it was just like you know because you're a writer because you teach writing because you've been a journalist you know because of all that stuff was it just like another writing or was that like a tool for you for healing well I uh, I went to a reading once and uh, it was about very um, emotional material and the author was asked a very similar question and she said um Yes, you know, being an artist and, and, and creating art can be very cathartic, um, but Prozac helps too, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> you need to find a balance, okay. Um, have there been artists over time who have worked out great trauma only through the art? I don't know about that. Uh, if you look at the track record of people like Ernest Hemingway, it's not too good, you know. Um, they, uh, they, they succumb to their, to their demons eventually, you know. So you know, there's your life as a person and there's your life as an artist. Um, I look, I mean, I, I, I have a lot more books in me and I have a lot more projects in me, but in some ways half the child will always be the most important thing I'll ever do because it's so personal for me. But mm -hmm. um, having said that, um, you know, I, I've had my own, you know, journey and my own, you know, healing and the rest of it. And um, the writing was a part of it, but it wasn't the only, I, I would be lying if I said, yes, you know, if you get this all down on paper, you'll be just fine. You, you know, there is a catharsis. There's no two ways about it, but I think it takes more than that. You know, I really do. Well, well and there's that always more than one way to, to work through things too. Like Caroline, Caroline and I talk about different methods all the time. And we talk to other people who have used different methods and some use a variety, some use just the one. So I think right. it really depends on the person where, you know, it, and the muse too. I think Caroline, you were talking about a muse not long ago, um, as well. That that it really depends on. Do you know what that is? Right, right. And I, you know, I've seen Carolyn, you know, use music. And Dawn, you and I have talked about writing. And now Carolyn, you're talking about writing. And look, I mean, as a as a as a writer, as a as a writing teacher, I can't advocate it enough. But um, I think it can be harmful to just sort of get up and say, well, if you do this project, you know, you'll feel better. Um, you will, but it, I don't, I don't know that it's always enough. I know it, it wasn't. You never, no, it's never enough. Yeah. There's, it's, it's like, it's like having a support group. You have to yeah. have, you have to have your mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical support Absolutely. ways of healing. And that's what I was, I wanted to, I'm, I'm glad we came to this because I wanted to ask also you know, can you, because we talk to people about this all the time with the healing, what kind of, can you share a couple of tools that you do use aside from, you know, what you just ex explained to people on, on what you do for yourself that help or has helped? 
Sure. Well, I, I found that um, I'm at my best when I address all the things you just talked about, sort of the emotional, the physical, the, the you know, the, the psychological. Um, you know, I, I have, um, like in recent years, um, I went back to uh, boxing. And, and when I go there, I'm one of those people that hates going to a gym because I hate being on a treadmill and just, you know, staring at the clock. I have OCD too. So when I do things that are numbers, it drives me crazy, like reps and like, oh, I have to do five more, five, four, three, three, you know, and, and I'm staring at clocks and I'm playing games in my head. And it's a lot of work, you know, mentally. Right. Um, the thing I love about boxing is it's a fantastic workout physically, but I don't think about it because it's a skill and I'm doing this thing. And so I'm all of a sudden I'm sweat is pouring off me, but I wasn't like I was on a treadmill, which is like, I mean, you know, it's actually an expression, right? On a treadmill, you're not going anywhere, right? So, but I found that, you know, working out and being physical is good. Using the brain is good. You know, talking about things is good. It's, it really is holistic. It really is, you know, big picture. You, I, I don't think, I think when you neglect one of those aspects, your emotional side, your, your physical side, your psychological side, uh, you know, the body has a way of making you pay, you know, for everything you do wrong. The body will always tell you. And whether it's, you know, alcohol, whether it's this, whether it's that, anger, you know, and, um, you know, I grew up in a household where there was anger and um, rage, I would say, you know, more, more than anger, rage and um, suppression, you know, and, you know, appearances were important, that type of thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. and it's unhealthy, you know, it's really unhealthy. And so it's hard to, it's hard to reprogram yourself in adulthood. Really, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like, you know, some of the hardest work I've ever done in my life is on myself, you know physically emotionally you know i mean yeah i do this work that the world sees and books and things like that but it's hard it's hard work you know and yep. um, there's no way but, around that yeah there is no way you're right don i mean because you know you will pay i mean <laughs> you know the body will make you pay and and for anybody that thinks that like well i'm i'm going to the gym and i'm working out but i'm not addressing you know pressing emotional problems mm -hmm. you'll your body will tell you one way or another. And that, yeah, and that's not a threat. The thing is, is that, and I've noticed this too with, with friends and with myself, is that the older you get, the longer that trauma or whatever happened to you or experience from childhood, whatever that is, the longer it sits in your body, the worse you're going to feel. And oh, you're not going to know. Most A lot of people don't even know that they're feeling or why they're right. feeling that way. You know? right. That happened yeah. to me where the body keeps the score. That's a, there's a book out about yeah. that where all the stuff that happened to me ended up in what I was experiencing at the time. 10 years ago, I had colitis. 10 years ago, I couldn't breathe if I walked up a, a flight of stairs. I had to lay down to catch my breath. You know, and it's probably a little over the over 10 years by now. I think it was 2008. So yeah, 12 yeah. years, but not too yeah. long. But there, there was, I was in such a bad state and I wasn't even overweight at that point. You know, I was just starting to put on the, the weight. So it, it really, it'll hit you and you don't know why. And you don't really think about, oh, this was from something that happened to me before. It's trauma. It's emotional. Right. Stuff. You don't think that. You think about, wow, what's, how come I all of a sudden have this asthma how come I all of a sudden have, you know, eating disorders and, and... And that's the challenge, that question right there. It's not all of a sudden. It's been building in the body since but that But you think of it as... And you don't even know it. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm a gymnast. I was varsity gymnast throughout my entire high school from freshman on. I was going to an academy. I have been in great shape up until the point where my life changed. And then all of a sudden, here I am. Wow. And I'm like... Yeah. How do I fix this? And I went through very bad bouts of shame and feeling bad. Like I feel bad that I'm fat. Mm -hmm. I feel bad that I have all this weight that I can't, I can't go up a flight of stairs. Yeah. Having to lay down and catch my breath. And so it actually, really hits you emotionally too on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. They actually call that toxic shame. So it's right. not even just being Which ashamed. makes it worse, by the way. Feeling ashamed or whatever, yeah. or a little bit of shame. Yeah. Toxic shame is something that's like dug in from the, from the beginning of, of your. Well, that's why I went into life. hiding. I was yeah. hiding. I was, right. I had, I, I wanted all my curtains closed. I mm -hmm. had to shut out the world. I've, was I was the one holding the camera by design. I didn't want to be on film. 
and the fact that I'm here doing this now, I mean, I, I definitely think I have turned around and, and no turned questions. the page, yeah. but it's been a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the it's thing. Harder it's harder like, to fix, harder to reverse. It is, yeah. And it's for children. I mean, we're all inside of us. We have our inner child. So, you know, if you can imagine how you feel as an adult with your inner child suffering like that, how, how are these children suffering? I mean, think about that. If you happen to be someone who watches this, who's watching their child suffer, you know, and you're getting upset because they're not talking to you or whatever, here's, a per, here's an excellent example of the result of that child suffering. You know, so whether it's your inner child that you get to work with, or your outer child that you get to work with and not get upset with or mad at because they don't understand what's happening. Um, take a look at Dawn. Take a look. We've had uh, we've had um, interviews with Elise Tobler. You know, any of these kids that have been Sorry. through yeah. Um, yeah. alienation. Yeah, it's like this is the result. And and as in this society, um, in general, most people have been traumatized. So there are many different variations and levels of it. Like when you were talking about your, your family of origin, Bill, you know, that generation, they're even tougher because the fathers absolutely don't want to say anything. My father came from that generation and he, he had me when he was older. So it's like getting through emotionally to that man is like pulling freaking teeth. One tooth is difficult. You been know, there, been that. There's yep. no yep. connection. And, sure. and so as, you know, whether it doesn't matter, I mean, I'm coming as a daughter who wants to be loved by her daddy, you know, and there's like, it, it's the same thing. You know, everybody's experienced this type of thing, but it's really challenging. I think, more, I don't want to say more. Um, what's coming to me is like from our generation, we've got all this, all these um, rules and, 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 um, past experiences from our parents that have come down into us and it's and we challenge we have to challenge not only that but how we felt about how that happened nowadays it seems like these kids are very emoting <laughs> they emote all the time yeah. you know and they're willing to do that and they don't have family members or for the most part who who are like no you can't cry some do a lot do but i'm yeah. just saying like my son is willing to cry now you know it's like what is this? Right. You know, right. so yeah, yeah, I just wanted to pull that out because it's 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 cha it's hard as a child. You know, Don Don went through some horrific stuff, and yeah. so did Elise, and so did you know every one of them, but, and so did our inner children. You know, so yeah. just pay attention so did to our parents, that, yeah. and so did our parents exactly. So just if you pay attention, think about all these horrific things, and then you will understand why these things are happening and then maybe you can make a decision as to how to shift that, you know, right. and, and, and take a pathway, whatever that is for you, you know, however, you know, what, what Bill did, the boxing, you know, that's the best way when you work your body out and you're letting all that, you've, you've seen me, I do it probably on every single, on every single interview. It's like getting that energy out of your body. Boxing's perfect because you get to punch something, Absolutely. you know? Absolutely, and there are no <laughs> societal ramifications. You don't get arrested, you see exactly. nothing. Yeah. Yes. Oh. yeah. yeah. Box. I never did that. I was always on the uneven bars or the balance beam, and there is no wow. way I'm getting on one of those right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I'll swing my feet. <laughs> well, you know, my, my, um, I come from a big family. I'm the youngest of 11, as I mentioned, and my sister Margie always uses this phrase. She says, um, you know, you got to do your homework. And by that, she means, you know, that not talking about as kids, as adults, you, no matter what it was that came before, you need to address it, you need to, you know, isolate it, deal with it, work it through, whatever. It's not saying that you weren't victimized, that you weren't, you know, treated unfairly, but the question is, do you want to carry it around your whole life, you know, and mm -hmm. do you want to be on, you know, a highway and somebody cuts you off without signaling and go into a rage, you know, I've been there, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not holier than now, trust me, you know, but at, one, at some point you say like, okay, yeah, that guy's an idiot and he should have signaled and, you know, but, you know, do I need to have my blood pressure go through the roof over it, you know? Right, right. Uh, is it's it worth it? 
I'm glad you brought he just that got up. off the exit and he's moving on and I'm the one sitting here. Right. Like, hey, That's what I was going to say. It's like, um, things come up in our lives all the time. And I just had an experience like that the other day where I was like, um, trying to figure out how to confront or talk to somebody and I couldn't do it. And I'm like getting angrier and angrier and angrier. And, and so I wrote all this stuff down and I've got it in my phone. And then, um, and then I'm like, I'm not sending it. And I got, I got up the next morning. I did a meditation. I'm doing a um, Joe Dispenza meditation, which is really cool, by the way. Um, and when I got up, I, after the meditation was over, right at the very end, I got this thought or this download is what I call it. It said, let go of your expectation of you and your attachment to however that's going to turn out or whatever you're doing, whether it's a relationship, whether it's, you know, what we're doing here, whether it's, um, you know, me finally writing my book, whatever that looks like, let go of the expectation and the attachment. And, and when that hit me, I was like, oh. Well, that totally makes sense because it proves that we are not herd minded or symbiotic where we're relying on each other's thoughts and understanding because we don't have those connections as we go through life. So the, our expectations that someone knows that and understands that, you know, why don't they just get it? It's common sense. Mm -hmm. We all think that ourselves, yet nobody else is thinking what we're thinking and we expect it. So we have to start thinking outside of the box sometimes and understanding that, wow, you know, maybe that person had a bad day too. Mm -hmm. right. And maybe right. they needed to get somewhere and, and, you know, we can make things up all we want. But the point is, is that if you reduce your own expectations, then you can reduce your own angers or, or anxiety. Anxiety is a killer. Mm -hmm. it is a really bad thing to hold on to yeah and and then as a along with the expectation because of however we were raised we have a certain perception and we think that per, our perception is the only perception <laughs> and so it's like you know well if i'm gonna show up on time that everybody needs to yeah. show up on time well everybody doesn't show up on time and how are you gonna deal with that you know without going ballistic and the other person doesn't give a crap because they've all never shown up on time. <laughs> yeah, wasn't it on our one of our last or recent shows where I was saying how we're all born into a small you know, into our little family, right? So we have our little family, and that's most of where our experiences come from and our mm -hmm. examples. And then that family, you know, we're in a home, right? And then beyond the home is our yard, and then we're attached to two neighbors, usually, right? So then that's an expansion of that experience. And then beyond that is, you know, your neighborhood block. And then beyond that is your, your town or your city. And then beyond that is maybe your county or state. And, you know, and then the world eventually. But what we started with is this one little teeny home, and everybody else has their one little teeny home. And we don't have a connection to each other in our experiences. So we learn based off of this, but we expect everybody to understand it. And Bill, this is a good segue into your article that you wrote the other day <laughs> about how everybody doesn't understand everybody's perceptions based off of the way they grew up. And you know right. what I'm talking about. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, Half the Child is also a website. Uh, no, no punctuation or anything. Half the Child, no periods or anything. Halfthechild.com. And um, I put up an essay I wrote the other day having to do with Black Lives Matter. Uh, because uh, like everyone, I've been watching the events in recent weeks and months and it's painful. And, uh, you know, I always try and, and look at things from all sides. I have people in my life uh, relatives and, and others who um, I love very much who are in law enforcement. And I, you know, I, I joked at one point in the essay that if you grow up Irish Catholic in the borough of Queens, then, you know, you have to have a couple of cops right. in the family. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's, it's by law, you know, it was mandatory when they came over to Ellis Island. It's like, okay, you're going to be a cop and you're going to be a nun, you know. Uh, <laughs> so um, at the same time, you know, I have so many people in my life who I love who are black and who have had experiences that are nothing like mine. And so my son, who is um, constantly teaching me stuff, 
Um, he and I went to a, a Black Lives Matter event here in Connecticut uh, in Hartford about two weeks ago. And he, I'm really inspired by him because he comes at these things in a way that I don't. He just comes at it like I think a lot of millennials do on certain things. Um, and millennials get a bad rap a lot of the time. And that's a whole other subject we could, we could discuss another time. But he comes at it as if, you know, well, this is wrong, so let's fix it. And there's no but after that, right? And that's what struck me. He's like, well, this is ridiculous. You know, um, we can't have this. We have to fix this. And anybody that gets in your way, I'm going to, you know, mow you down. And so there's not this sort of like, well, yeah, but it's a really complex problem. And blah, 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 blah. That's the way it's always been. And blah. no, fix it, you know. And so I'm inspired by him, you know. I mean, I'd like to think that I've inspired him once or twice, but um, so I got sure to, I started, <laughs> yeah, right. I, I started uh, writing this essay that you're referring to. It was called uh, Two Lives, Two Americas. And um, I recall that when I was 20 and I was, uh, you know, working in a gas station, um, my best friend was, was um, a guy who was black and um, he, you know, we, we're, we're still friends to this day. He was my best man when I got married. And we worked at this gas station and, you know, we were hanging out doing the stuff that 20 year olds do, uh, going and drinking beer in the basement and watching Mr. Ed, you know, and watching TV and um, just silly stuff. And we were in the car and he was driving and we got pulled over. And I, you know, in the essay, I talk about the fact that I was laughing when we got pulled over. I thought it was funny, you know, it's like we're not doing anything. And it quickly became very unfunny when I saw how they treated him. And I was 20 years old. I was white. I came from a family where there were cops in the family. And I, I, I really thought I'd missed something. I'm like, first of all, there was no traffic infraction. So there's no reason to be pulled over in the first place. But what did he do? You know, well, he was black. And so... You know, I, I just, I wrote this essay hoping that in a very small way I can contribute to the greater good because I don't want to sort of be accused of appropriating an issue that I don't fully understand. I'm willing to say I don't fully understand. I don't know what it's like to be black in America. I don't. But I do know from all the people that I know and love who are black, they tell me about, you know, the talk that you tell your kids when you're young. This is what you do when, you know, you're approached by a police officer. Um, when my son was young, I gave him the white Americans talk, which was if you get lost and you can't find mommy or daddy and you're in a grocery store or something, you know, but if the man says he's a, a police officer or the woman, but they don't have a uniform, then say, no, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, they're your friend and they'll help you. That's not the experience for a great many Americans. And so, you know, once again, here I am advocating and, and I keep going out of my comfort zone and out of my comfort zone the older I get. Um, because, you know, the, the airline advocacy, I, I went into it sort of reluctantly because I felt I wasn't being a journalist anymore, but then I embraced it. And then, you know, half the child comes out and all of a sudden I'm speaking before groups on parental alienation and custody and abduction. And I said, well, here we go again, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because it's not as if, certainly I don't have the answers, but I, I did say in this essay, I think, you know, my sense is, enough is enough. This has to stop. This has been going on for 400 years. And we have to have those uncomfortable discussions. And there was a young woman who spoke at the event that we were at in Hartford uh, two weeks ago, who put it very well. She said, let this be, <laughs> she said, she was speaking to the white people in the audience, basically. She said, let's let this be the most uncomfortable Thanksgiving ever. You know, have that conversation with the uncle or the grandfather or whoever it is that, you know, always makes a stupid joke or always makes it, you know, enough. It's not enough, you know, and it's not enough to say, well, I don't feel that way, or I don't talk that way, or I don't act that way. Um, I, I, I really have come to see that it's not enough to be that sort of good person who is silent. And I, and I saw a sign at this event that said, silence equals sign violence. And that's it. It's not enough to say, well, I'm on your side. No, well, then, you know, you need to talk to the people in your life that need talking to. And together, try and figure this out, you know. Well, and and yeah. so does, and I think part of the, you know, being white and not understanding what it's like to be a black and to be pulled over like that or to be treated the way they're treated. I think what's important now is they can say silence equals violence, but so is turning that deaf ear and avoiding that, like just not seeing it. Well, yeah. What they want yeah. is they want 
we need to be willing to open our hearts, open our minds, open our ears and hear and see the problem for what it really is. Mm -hmm. That's when we can actually participate and help resolve it rather than be silent and turn to that deaf, that deaf ear. Yeah. And fear, the reason why most people fear things is because they don't understand it. And if you even because take a I moment, a deaf ear. if you, right. yeah, if you take a moment to just mm -hmm. read something, I'd like to, I'd like to share something that, that came up for me. I'd, um, I can't, I think, um, I can't remember who posted this. I think it was junior Witter. Um, he was, he posted like a really powerful, um, post and then somewhere in the middle of the post, he had a link to, um, a, a story about Black Wall Street, which is in, which is in Tulsa. Yeah. And I'd never seen this before. And here's the thing, especially for our generation and all these generations, it's like they can put whatever they want in our textbooks for us to learn. But they're not, in most cases, it's not the truth. It's a, might be a piece of the truth or not at all. It matters who and wrote it. It depends on who wrote it. It depends on, and they, and they have this whole process of how they pick uh, textbooks and all this stuff. I'm not even going to get into that. I read this article and basically what it, um, what it showed me was that aside from what happened, I mean, this was back in the early 1900s in Tulsa where, where uh, a group I don't, I don't want, I can't be totally specific because it was a while ago that I read it, but a group of black families moved from the South, you know, like Alabama, Mississippi, that area out to Tulsa um, to, because they weren't able to experience their life like the white people did, because at the time they had, you know, they couldn't even drink out of the same water fountain at that time. And, and so they moved out there and they, they literally took a por portion of Tulsa, a few blocks, and they built a, a community that thrived. The, the, issue turned, <coughs> the issue turned out where the white, the lower income white people that surrounded that area were getting mad because they weren't making money the same way. I mean, we were getting like um, millionaires and, and hundred heirs in that time, obviously, you know, and, and these people were building a life for themselves and, and making money. And these other, these white people didn't like that. So they came in and, you know, same thing back then. And, and um, the police actually, somebody had lit a fire and the police were just standing back watching. They also deputized the white people who were causing the problem to help them with the problem, you know, and it was like, nobody knows this stuff. I had no idea this happened. And when I read that, I was like, come on, you know, I mean, it's like, I get that if you've got something that happened to you in your life, don't take it out on someone else because you don't understand what it is. And, and I don't want to go on a soapbox because I could, it's pretend it's very easy for me to do that. But the point is, is learn, understand, get a feeling. I mean, you felt, you felt trampled on in your life before as a child, no matter who you are. Yeah. So understand what's happening with, with people in the world. It doesn't matter, you know, just they're human beings. They bleed red. We bleed red. Everybody bleeds red. We all want love and want to receive, um, want to give love. You know, I mean, there's just, if you don't believe that, that's okay, but you don't need to hurt and kill people to prove well, that point. There's either. one thing, we have a bunch of people that want us to live in this utopia, right? Right. The only way to live in a utopia is to actually have that acceptance of every single person. You know, we have to have that utopian, you know, they want, whether you want socialism or any, any of those things, which I don't want to get into any of that as well, but you have to have this environment where everybody is accepting of everybody, regardless of where they came from or what they do. Everybody would have that same opportunity. They would have everything in order to even exist there. But even just, yeah, accepting would be beautiful. Even just to understand what someone else is going through and having empathy for them, <laughs> that would be a good start, you yeah. know? Yeah, Sometimes so I have to shed our own narcissisms and mm -hmm. have a little bit more compassion and understanding. Yeah, yeah, and I'm just grateful. I'm so grateful that I keep getting the opportunity to read. Like when I when that came popped up on my screen, Bill, that article or what you wrote, I was like, yes. Every single time something like that comes up, I'm like, yes, some more information. I mean, here's the thing. 
I used to follow, and I still do in a way, Native American um, past spirituality, all this stuff. And I started doing research on the Native Americans. And somebody's not going to like what I'm about to say, but Columbus, when he came, when he came down to South America, he was, they were looking for gold. And they were treating the, the, um, the Native people down there horribly. They would, and I'm going to say this. They, if they couldn't find gold, they would literally cut their hands off. And this was being led by Christopher Columbus. This is the same guy that we are celebrating, you know, Columbus Day. So this isn't just in, in this realm. It's in all realms. We're, we were told bull. And, and it's, why are we being told that? Because it's, that's how they want to make us believe. So they can, you know, whatever, whoever they is, whatever that is. The point is, we don't need that anymore. It's time to do these shifts. Whoever you are, it's just shift. Learn, understand, feel, feel. Okay, I'm off my soapbox now. I said I wouldn't get on one, but that actually for me is a good segue back to where we started, which is the parental custody and abduction issues and parental alienation because um, I have to tell you that as a single father and as someone who wrote a novel about a single father, um, I bump into prejudices and myths all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and we talked about it earlier, you know, talking about dads that, that are from another generation that, that aren't as devoted to their kids as most dads are now. But um, when I, when I, we were talking about how the fact that, you know, so many publishers turned it down. So I made a decision you know, I, I reached out to writer friends and I said, so tell me the truth. You know, you, all good writers have packs with other good writers to say, tell me if this is junk, you know, if it is fine, you know, and they said, no, it, it you know, it should be published. So I decided to self publish, which is a whole nother, you know, learning curve for me. And it took months to try and master that because those are not my skill sets. What do I know from, you know, paper stock and printing size and all the rest of it and fonts and everything. A5. And then the marketing and, <laughs> and all of it. Yeah, it's, it's, and the marketing and the sales and the distribution and all of that, all the things that HarperCollins did for me on my first book and I didn't have to worry about. And so, like I said, I started going online and I said, well, okay, now who would be interested in this book? Hopefully all kinds of people, but let me reach out to some of these parenting groups. So I did. So I set up, I should be more accurate, my son set up um, all these accounts for me on Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff and Instagram. And I started just friending people like crazy. Okay, parents for this and fathers for that and mothers for this. And again, maybe a little naively, naively, just like I was naive in that car when I was 20 and a police car pulled us over with a, with a black driver. Um, I thought like, well, we're all in this together, right? And suddenly, I started looking at posts and I think in a week I must have started following about a thousand people or sent out a thousand friend requests on Twitter and Facebook. And then I started reading some of them and then I started unfriending <laughs> and, I'm <laughs> and I'm deleting, you know, and, um, you know, straight up with you exactly what it was. I saw men who just absolutely, you know, were misogynist and hated women. They just hated women clearly. And we're using, you know, words that uh, I would never repeat for you, but you know what some of them are. And then on the flip side, I saw a lot of really angry, embittered women who the, 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 the synonym, excuse me, the antonym for uh, misogyny is misandry, but you don't hear that word as much. Women who hate men, you know, or people who hate men. And um, so all of a sudden I'm seeing this man bashing and father bashing. So, you know, I remove myself as much as I could from both. I still see it popping up even in some of the organiz you know, the, the, the um, social media threads that the three of us are on at times where people will bash mothers or bash fathers, you know. And, um, you know, Michael goes into court naively. He goes into court saying, well, I'm a good, loving, decent father. I'm a good guy. I have my faults. I have, you know, a temper. I have this, I have that. I have all kinds of problems like everybody else. But no one could say that I don't love my, my son and I wouldn't do anything for him. So eventually this will all work out. Well, he's dead wrong, right? Because, um, you know. Because of those outer fringes. fringes. Absolutely. And, and look, I mean, what, you know, when we boil prejudice down, what is it really, when you really boil it down, whether it's about skin color or religion or gender or whatever, what is it but 
you're being judged by a larger group, right? I mean, that's really the sort of textbook definition of what prejudice is, right? You're not being judged as an individual, you're being, indivi you're being judged by, you know, criteria from the group you come from. And Michael experiences it, you know. Now, that is something that certain people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear, you know, in an age of where we're all becoming more aware of our privilege. I mean, I, I spoke about the privilege I had to be 20 years old and get pulled over by a cop and not be worried, you know, like, oh, mm. I might get a ticket, you know. I never at 20, you know, ever dreamed I'd be dragged and, you know, thrown in the street and tased or anything else, right? And so I, I, I recognize and, and, and acknowledge my privilege in that regard. But um, it's hard to be writing a novel about a white heterosexual male who is being discriminated against in the courts. And he is. There's just no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes this sort of, you know, um, uh, sort of thing where you're in a competition. You know, it's like, well, my grief is greater than yours or my my privilege is less than yours or my, you know, the, 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 the things I've experienced are worse than what you've experienced. Um, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, ideally, I know that's asking for a lot. I understand that. I'm not naive. But, um, you know, the bottom line is in New York State, where this novel takes place, the, the credo in, in family court is, and I understand this is the tr it's true in many states, um, the best interests of the child. That's what's supposed to drive the judges and the lawyers and the psychologists and the, everybody. And I say supposed to because it doesn't. Okay. And we all know that. And it doesn't. And what often drives it is money, but also it's prejudices of different kinds, right? And so, um, you know, if we lived by that simple credo, the best interest of the child, to me, 90% of these problems would disappear overnight because we would say, well, what's best for this kid, you know? And Michael's position, even the term custody battle, I've resisted that. I mean, mm -hmm. I use it once or twice in half the job, <clears throat> but I resist it because like every war, every fight, every sports competition, what is a battle but a winner and a loser, right? Mm -hmm. um, nobody wants a truce, right? Nobody wants a tie in basketball, right? You want, you know, tiebreaker. So um, with this, with Half the Child, I, Michael doesn't look at it that this is a fight. Like he's going to win or his ex-wife is going to win and then they win Ben. He is trying to say Ben deserves two parents and he loves both parents. So why can't he have both parents? Now, some people think that's silly or naive or, you know, uh, pie in the sky. If that is truly what motivates you as a parent, if you say, what is best for the kid? Not what's best for my career, what's best for my bank account, what's best for my libido, what's best for my dating life, whatever the heck it is, um, what's best for uh, why I want to live. But if you truly say, you know, what's best for the kids, then you make sacrifices, you know. And that's the part that a lot of people don't want to do. They want it all, right? And so, you know, I mean, we're not talking, you always have to give this caveat. I know you do. We're not talking about parents that shouldn't be parents. We're not talking about abusive parents and parents that parents are, don't want to be parents. Drugs and alcoholic and violent and all the rest of it. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, you know, if there are two available parents, then they should both be in the kid's life. It sounds so simple, and yet it's not what happens every day of the week in courts all over the country and all over the world, you know. And Michael is just, you know, he walks into this, it's like he walks into a buzzsaw, you know. He just, um, he never saw it coming. And, um, you know, Dawn, I think I was sharing with you recently, I got a criticism from a reader who, who had a lot of problems with half the child. And I, I always loved engaging with readers, no matter what the criticism is. And so I said, please tell me, I'd love to know. And, and she was saying that he made so many legal mistakes. And I said, right, that's the point. You know, he, he does, he's not a lawyer and he doesn't know this world. And he said, well, at this point, he should have done this. And at this point, he should have, you know, gotten a new lawyer. And at this point, he should have asked for an appeal. And at this point, and the person I was talking to, <laughs> big surprise, was a lawyer, right? And I said, right, you're a lawyer. I'm a novelist. Uh, I didn't want to write a novel about a lawyer in a custody battle because to me, that would be pretty damn boring, you know? Um, you would think a lawyer would make the right steps. He's an air traffic controller but he could be, you know, a grocery store clerk. He could be a truck driver. He could be, you know, a dentist. He could be anything outside of that world. He talks to airplanes for a living. That's what he does. He doesn't yeah. know what you're supposed to do. And so again, that's why first person, that's why present tense, you know, um, <clears throat> the scenes in the air traffic control tower. I mean, it's all about present tense because there is no past tense in that world. It's right now you're talking to this plane right now, talk to mm -hmm. that plane, 
get that plane on the ground, whatever, you know, address that emergency. There's no past, there is no future in air traffic control. It's right now. And you know something else about, excuse me, something else that you also brought to mind with air choosing an air traffic controller is you pick probably one of the highest stress jobs in this, in the, in the world. (laughs) to do yeah. that so it's like you're already going in in, in stress mode and, and 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 people have so many psychological problems within right. that within that world and stress right. and then you add this on top of it it's like right. whoa wait a minute <laughs> well yeah and I'm, I'm 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 glad you brought that up Calvin, because um here's a little uh, inside tidbit about the book um michael was not an air traffic controller until very late uh in the publication process um, I actually, he was a salesman and, um, oh, that's boring. <laughs> you know, you know, here, here, this was my thinking. My thinking is I'm immersed in air aviation all the time. I'm always writing. I worked in the airline industry for seven years. I was in the air force auxiliary. I, I, you know, I've been around airplanes my whole adult life. I write about airlines. I go to Congress and testify about airlines. And I was like, you know, damn, this novel is not going to have any airplanes in it. And then I said, what am I thinking? The salesman? Come on. That's what you know. I needed, I needed his job to have three things. I needed his job to be stressful. Uh-huh. <laughs> Check. I needed his job to be critical in a life and death sense. Check. Check. Okay. I mean, if you lose the sales account, it's bad, but what are you going to do, right? <laughs> right. I needed his job to be immediate. Okay, and, and that is about as immediate as a critical job can be. You know, a doctor can mess up and you may not realize it until three months later, he gave you the wrong prescription or she did something wrong, you yeah. know, it comes out later, right? Air traffic control, you never find out a week later. It's colliding, yeah, that's... Find out about 10 seconds later. Yep. Yeah, and there's, there is a scene in there that describes yeah, that yeah, very yeah. well, too. <laughs> but yes, there's a scene that, you know, that I'll allude to that, um, you know, Michael is an air traffic controller, air traffic controller. Right. I mean, he is somebody that always prided himself um, when he was in the military and when as a civilian and LaGuardia Airport among air traffic controllers. It's like other air traffic controllers bow because they know that it is not only one of the busiest airports, it's one of the smallest airports in the country. Um, Washington National and New York LaGuardia have the shortest runways of any major Mm -hmm. airports in the country. They're only 7000 feet long and it is high stress. It never stops. And so and he thrives and he's great and he's always had this ability whether he had marital problems money problems whatever when he gets up in that tower he's just absolutely focused on those planes and that's it and that's why he's so well respected even by people who don't like him they respect him but he finds that for the first time in his life now due to his problems with ben and with this custody with this abduction it starts bleeding over into his work and we won't say what happens but a very critical thing happens where he screws up um, and we'll leave it at that for now. But, um, you know, th- there's, that's just one manifestation. We were talking before about the, the body, mind, you know, emotions, all that. Michael's entire life in Half the Child, it unravels. So that as, it, as this custody thing goes on and on, um, it affects his finances, it affects his career, it affects his friendships, it affects his physical health, his mental health. He starts putting on weight, he's not taking care of himself. He um, suddenly becomes depressed. He's, you know, depressed to the point of clinical depression and and suicidal depression. And his whole, his whole life is falling apart, you know. Um, But there's a lot of good things too, you know. There are relationships that he thought were strong that aren't. And then there are relationships that he didn't think were that strong that turned out to be quite strong. So I think that's the type of journey a lot of people have. You don't know what your life is going to be like when you're faced with something that dramatic and that traumatic, you know, and right. then suddenly you find allies, you know, and he is lucky. He is privileged. I don't, you know, I wouldn't say otherwise, just as I am privileged in many ways, but it's not enough to just give somebody a label and say, well, you're privileged. Therefore you have no problems. I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, um, he has problems that other people wouldn't begin to understand. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's, I think, I think that's where, I think that's where um, sometimes where we get so self-focused with our own problems, we have a hard time recognizing that everyone has got something going on. And and that's the key is to step back out of your, your own, I'm going to use it, shit, and then recognize that everybody's got shit happening and especially the big stuff you know it's like just empathy is really <laughs> yeah it doesn't know. mean that you have to deal with it you don't have right. to muck it you just need to you know 
realize it. Yeah. And, yeah. And just be human. This is, that's all, that's all you need to do. And, you know, I mean, I'd like for you, um, we, we're, we're um, coming close or actually we've gone a little bit over, but that's okay. I, I'd like for you as a father, if you can, to give just father, father to father, or just in general, some kind of anything that you might want to uh, say beyond that you didn't get to say before that to help other people, you know, work through this in such a way that they can actually, you know, begin the healing work, continue the healing work, you know, whatever, some, anything else that you have that you might want to offer to people? Well, you know, before I said, you know, I've been a lot of things and I've been a, you know, a writer and a teacher and everything, but nothing's more important than being a dad. It sounds corny to say that. It sounds like something that should be on a coffee mug or a, a baseball cap or something. But, you know, you either, you either believe that or you don't. You either live that way or you don't. I mean, you know, there are plenty of parents that parenting is not their number one priority. We all know that. I mean, and, you know, that's not a thing of the past. There are people that have children who, quite frankly, I don't think should have children, but they do, mm -hmm. you know, and for whatever reason. But as, as, as simple as it sounds, I truly believe Look, it's one of those jobs that you can't do perfectly. You know, it's nobody bats a thousand as a parent. You're going to screw up. You're going to do things that you're ashamed of, do things that you wish you could turn the clock back 24 hours and say, I wish I hadn't said that or whatever or done that. But I, I truly do believe, even though the courts don't, I do believe the best interest of the child, that if you put your kid or your kids first and, and you say, you know, what's best for them? Does that mean I don't take that promotion or I don't take that, you know, or I don't date that person or, you know, I don't marry that person or I don't take that, you know, transfer, whatever it is that's going to put their interests first. Um, it's one of those jobs that, you know, we're talking about air traffic control, it's immediate. Well, parenting is the opposite in some ways. Sometimes it's immediate and sometimes you get that hug and your heart breaks, you know, into a million pieces. But sometimes it's, you know, you're, you're, you're really this is long-term dividends. You know, maybe a kid will turn around as an adult and suddenly say, oh, well, you know, you're not the idiot I thought you were, <laughs> you know, or what have you, you know? Uh, yeah, you know, parent, it's, parenting yeah. is the thankless job. Often, yeah. you know, there's no gratitude in it in, in many cases because they have to understand it. So until they do... Right, right. And, and so if you're a narcissist, for example, and you're looking for immediate rewards all the time, then this isn't the job for you, right? Because you don't always get them. But if you truly do it in, in good faith to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm making the best decisions I can possibly make based on all the constraints and all the problems and all the rest of it. Um, I do believe, I believe in my heart of hearts that eventually the kids are going to recognize that. They, mm -hmm. will, they, will, they will think it, you know, uh, they'll think it through and say, Okay, you know, and so if you're ready for that conversation, look, any kid can make a long list of, you know, a laundry list of all the things you did wrong. Who can't? I could do it for my parents. You could do it for yours. We all could. But that's the way it goes, too. That's the direction about. it flows. Right. I'm saying, you know, look, if you put, the, if you put your kid first, have faith that they're going to recognize that down the road. And it, it's hard. It's lonely. It's, you know, and when, you know, a kid is an adolescent and has headphones on and doesn't want to look at you and doesn't want to be seen in a public place with you, it's hard, right? This is not a... That's you know, normal. So if they're doing it during the parental alienation thing, which my daughter did, then yeah. it's normal. And it, well, that was hard for me to take because that's exactly what she did, you know? So right. I, I, uh, I attributed it to that. But yeah. Right. That's well, you get back to the supplements a lot. And, and, and without, I don't want to give away important plot points in Half the Child. That's the last thing I want to do. But there are sections of the book in which Ben gives Michael very backhanded compliments where he more or less takes him for granted because he knows that he's secure in his father's love. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's the greatest kind of compliment, you know, to have a kid just know that you're there. Um, so they're not worried about you. They're not thinking about you because, well, you'll always be there, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. to me, it's, you know, it's like I get talking about it. It's the greatest compliment you're ever going to get is yeah. a child's trust. You know, what's better than that? Children give love, but trust is harder, you know? Mm -hmm. And so. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Bill. That was, that was really, uh, you. okay. You got me. <laughs> um, I'm going to, I'm going to segue from an emotional moment, which you got me choked up to, but, um, <laughs> 
I'm going to be now. I'm going to be the crass um, promoter. Afterchild.com. Please. Yeah. Well, that was oh, my question. I can't even ask you. <laughs> that was my next question. So how can we get in touch with you? <laughs> oh, good question. I hadn't thought about that. Yes, please. Yes. Um, sure. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Great. Right. Way to be on it, Bill. <laughs> nice. Kindle, All right. So the audio. Yeah, so halfthechild.com. And from there, there are links. If you'd like to buy it on Amazon, you can do that. Some people like other booking channel, uh, booking uh, channels like uh, barnesandnoble.com. Um, it's a self-published book. I mean, we've been talking about that. So it's hard. Self-publishing is the hardest thing I've ever done career-wise. Buy the book. Uh-oh. Amazon and, and Goodreads and give it uh, a favorable review because that yeah. generates more promotion in ways that you couldn't even buy. In other words, now when you go on Amazon to buy a book and it says, oh, you're buying this book? Maybe you'd like Half the Child because X amount of people have liked it, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning all these things about self-publishing that I never had to worry about before. It's tough and I, I don't like coming on here as a huckster and trying to sell stuff, well, but look, you know, it's... it's, no. it's I'm going to hug for you. I'm going to hug for you because as a mom who went through it while reading it, I also got to experience what it felt like for Michael as a dad. Right. It's not, it, it, it's not the same and it is the same. Right. So right. it's like, it's the same. It may not be the same story, the same, you know, there, there, there's little nuances that are not identical because as a mother, it's a little bit different. Well, it's right. the same but story, somebody, just different events. It's just, that's the same thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. But I'm, what I'm saying is like as em emoting through the book mm -hmm. is, is so similar. It's like, oh my God, you know, I wish my, you know, whoever would behave that way. I wish my ex-husband would behave that way. I right. wish my, you know, whoever that is. And right. just being able to live in that was so how do I use this delicious for me? Because it was like, I, I could feel what I wanted my, you know, my relationship to have been. So as a mom or as a female, that helped me to, to see that there are good men out there who do believe that, you know? So on what you just said though, is very powerful because I want to point out that you're a mom that actually empathized and understood what a father went through. And this is what we need more of. We need moms and fathers, moms and dads, mothers and fathers to stop attacking each other and start working together. It's not about who was, you know, who's better in a child's life. The child needs both of you. So stop arguing and start working right. together. Right. Yes, right. absolutely. And, don't, and don't have it be half the child. Yeah. Well said, Dawn. No, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you're right. And, and people, you know, women are responding to Michael. I, I'll tell you, if, if anyone, you know, listening, if they want to, um, if they want to contact me, just do it right through halfthechild.com. There's a, there's a way there to send me email and I'll be happy. I talk to everyone who contacts me. And um, I will tell you that I've gotten, you know, uh, women who have said that they're falling in love with Michael. And Michael got a uh, marriage proposal about six months ago. Yay for Michael! <laughs> I have to news to this woman that he doesn't exist, that he's a fictional character. But on behalf of him, I'm flattered, you know. Um, and she said I would marry him in five minutes as soon as I met him. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and but said, there are fathers out there like that. That's the yeah. key. Oh, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, to all those editors who said, well, that, you know, this was not something that, you know, would, would resonate with people, what can you say, you know? Um, let, Turns you know, out it is. Right. And, and so, you know, we'd love for, for dads to read it, for moms to read it, for children who have been through these experiences to read it. And all of the other people, you know, one thing that you get from Half the Child, he has, a, he has this whole network of people. He has this whole family and friends and a mother and siblings and, you know, and, and um, you know, his coworkers. Um, they're all there for him, you know. Some are not, but many are, you know. And so... That's the other thing about these things, as, as we know, they don't just affect the kids and the parents. They affect grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, they yep. so many people, you know. And when you, you abduct a child, you're not just keeping the child from 
that parent. You're keeping that child in some cases from 15 or 20 or 25 people or more, you mm -hmm. know, um, when you, you know, when you come from big families and, you know. People that would add part. more love. They yeah. add more love. And Absolutely. Children, you can't have well, enough. Yeah, and, and the thing is, is that it's not even 15, 20, 25. What you're doing is you're generationally keeping them from future generations too. So it's not just the immediate family or the immediate generation. It's every single generation in the future that you keep them yeah. from. That's a very good point. And I want to I wanna share something I haven't shared before. When my, well, parts of it I have. Everybody knows that my mom replaced my dad with a stepfather. And in every in every way possible, there is absolutely no evidence that he's not my father, like on church records or ancestry records on all the genealogy. There's all kinds of places that if someone looking back 200 years from now were to follow this paper trail, they would follow his lineage, his, hair, his ancestors as part of their family. So you have diverted an entire line of genealogy, I want to say, ancestries, you know, descendants yeah. and ancestors both. It's, you've given them a totally false story and they have, they're following the wrong family line. And now you're forcing them when they get older to do, have, to have to do the research because you are no longer around. You never gave the information and ancestry.com will help them, hopefully help them find them, but there shouldn't be any reason why they should have to mm -mm. dig that deep to find out who their family is. There's no reason at all. So, so that's one of the things that I have all over my Ancestry.com page is all of that information so that 200 years from now, they're going to be able to look back and say, wow, that was a mess. But they're going to know that that's not the right one. This is the right one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because yeah. I can't let it be wrong from here on out because people take that seriously. You know, sure. they, they look at that for their, their ancestry line and there's lots of reasons why people do it, but it, you can't, you can't lead that many people into, into that deception. Well, and also, and also to these poor, you know, I mean, there's so many kids out there looking for their parents. You know, why are you setting them, why, why is there a setup initially through parental alienation to not even allow that? You know, they're going I'm to try it. at some point. That's one of the things I'm going to fight for is that I believe that every child has the right, whether they were adopted, you know, young, maybe at birth, or if they were adopted when they were 10, or if they were taken out of the home and put into foster care and then adopted. I don't care how they got adopted they have the right to know who their biological parents were. The only exception, and I'm not sure how I feel about it 100%, but some parents don't want anything to do with having a child, so they, have, they adopt it's them not. out, and they, they walk away 100%. That's going to be painful for the child. They still, I still feel like they deserve the right to know, but when you have parents that want to know where their child's where their children are and you have children that want to know where their parents are i believe that they should absolutely have the right to know that and they should have the the capability of cutting through that red tape and getting some answers they need it for medical information they need it for just having answers that are deep down inside that nobody can can fill you ready for the you ready for the big question of the day to answer that the question is, who am I? Exactly. Because we all ask that question. And what am I doing here? Sure. Yep. You're right. Yep. So, so everybody, one of these days, that's breath. going to be a law. I'm going to make sure it happens. <laughs> everybody take a deep breath. I'm reminding myself. Ah, okay. So, yeah. Wow. All right. Wasn't expecting that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, thank you so much, Bill. We are so grateful that you took the time to spend with us. And um, 
I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't recommend his book more just for my own feelings and experiences that I, that worked me, you know, helped me to see things differently. And um, for all the fathers out there, you need to read this book. Mm -hmm. Yep. Fathers, yeah. mothers, everybody should read this book. When, uh, when, when the agent was trying to sell it, he did some research. He's from a very big agency and they have a research department and they looked and I was shocked to find out that there has not been a novel published in the United States um, about any kind of uh, custody issues or divorce from a father's perspective since 1973. And that novel was Kramer versus Kramer, which eventually became a movie that a lot of people know with Dustin mm -hmm. Hoffman and Wall Street. Mm -hmm. But the novel came out in 73. So that's almost 50 years ago now. Now think about that a moment. There have been nonfiction books written, you know, um, about these issues, but there hasn't been a novel, a fictional account from a father's perspective in 47 years um, until half the job, really. So, oh. um, I, and I didn't know that. I had no idea. I mean, I knew they were scarce, and I, but I didn't know that there hadn't been one in, you know, almost five decades. Mm -hmm. um, that's crazy, you know. Um, this is such an important experience that so many people go through and so many fathers that, that, that you know, um, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm happy that anyone can take something from it, whether you're a child, a grandparent, whatever you are, you know. Um, uh, I tried to, you know, get across that Michael's not in this alone, you know. He's not, and you're not, and no one is in it alone. We've all experienced it. There are people out there. Yeah, yeah so thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you so much, both of you. Dawn, Carolyn, thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Love to come back anytime and keep up the conversation. All right, well, let's wrap this up. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Please reach out to Bill. Look up his website at halfthechild.com. Buy his book, read his book, and then share it. And experience it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So have a great day. We'll talk to you guys next week. Bye bye. Okay.